Welcome to St. Joseph Radio Presents. Uh, we are going to be talking about the family. I don't know about you, but my family's perfect. We don't have any problems. Everybody's perfect. We don't have any skeletons. It's, it's all just wonderful, you know, kind of like God's family. The, the holy family was modeled after the Caruso family. See? That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Obviously, I have something to confess this <laughs> afternoon. Come and watch us. This is going to be good. Welcome to the St. Joseph Radio Presents live program broadcasting to you from the Rome of the West, St. Louis, Missouri. The program that for over 30 years has brought you eloquent speakers from across the globe to help explain, clarify, and evangelize the Catholic faith. Our program covers a variety of topics relating to current issues and occurrences in our daily lives. Now, with the aid of technology, we are able to bring the gospel message to the four corners of the world, where Christ himself did say, those who have ears ought to hear. It is our hope at St. Joseph Radio that through these programs, we can help evangelize the world and change one soul at a time. Now, here is your host to introduce today's guest and topic. Well, thank you, Matt, and uh, I am your host today. I'm Peter Karutz, and I'm here live in studio with Dr. Gossard, Brian Gossard. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me again, yeah. and, Peter. And doctor is a obstetrician. That's correct. So you know all about babies and I get families. invited to a lot of birthday parties. I bet you do. I bet you do. Yeah. But today's topic is going to be God's family and, uh, you know, maybe the family tree. You know, see, uh, God's family must be perfect, you know, like mine. I don't have any problems. I don't have any skeletons in my closet. There's no... No, I think I think God's family is very real and maybe very typical of of the world, huh? We yes, yes. I, I always am comforted by the fact that God had trouble with his kids. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. if I have trouble with mine, I you know, I have good company. Yeah. So we're gonna reach back. This is going to be an ongoing series, next couple of months anyway, once a month, so keep us uh, tuned in on your uh, dial and programmed in your calendar. Uh, and so we're going we're gonna to start out with God's family. We're reaching back sort of to the beginning, sort of to the beginning. And speaking of the beginning, as Father Augustine always says, the Benedictines say that no good work starts before we start with prayer. So, uh, Doctor, would you uh, lead us in an opening prayer? Absolutely. Uh, on this feast of St. Therese of Lisieux and with the feast of St. Faustina coming up this coming week, I thought a prayer from Faustina would be appropriate. Uh, as far as being little. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. O God, one in the Holy Trinity, I want to love you as no human soul has ever loved you before. And although I am utterly miserable and small, I have nevertheless cast the anchor of my trust deep down into the abyss of your mercy. In spite of my great misery, I fear nothing, but hope to sing you a hymn of glory forever. Let no soul, even the most miserable, fall prey to doubt. For as long as one is alive, each one can become a great saint. So great is the power of God's grace, it remains only for us not to oppose God's action. Lord, we ask that you bless our families. We ask that you teach us about your family so that we can improve, that we can love you better. We give you all honor and glory. In your holy name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Father, Father, Son, Son Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. That was St. Uh, Faustina? Faustina, so correct. So St. Faustina, who lived many years ago in a far-off country as a, as a nun, a cloistered nun, if I recall. Right, a good Polish nun. A I good might Polish nun. So isn't that a, a, a sign of the power of God? Holy smokes, we're sitting here in St. Louis, Missouri, reflecting on a prayer written by a Polish nun who we, by all rights, shouldn't even know existed. Well, we, we uh, celebrate the feast day of St. Therese of Lisieux today, today yes. who spent roughly eight years of her life in the convent before she died of tuberculosis at the yeah. age of 24. 24 and in yeah. that brief eight years in the convent, she is one of the doctors of the church. Right. And her little way is not simple. It's very complicated. Yeah. But loving God in the simple, small things. And, and that's uh, mm -hmm. when we look at history, I think if we can look at the small things, we find ways to love God every day. Better. That's right. And, and be confident to, that you can do whatever God is calling you to do because God calls you to do it. I was in my men's group this morning, just to digress, 
there was a guy who was who said the opening prayer, and he, he uh, I invited him before, and he didn't, but he did this time, and he says he says, you know, who am I that I should uh, say this opening prayer in front of a big group? And um, I think sometimes we say that, who am I, right? Well, who are we? We're God's beloved children, right? And He's going to care for us and make sure we have what we need to do what he wants us to do. And, and even someone small and obscure like Therese of Lisieux yeah. had an impact on the church that, that was unbelievable, Yeah, that she never knew at the time of her life. Never knew. Never knew. And, and we may never know the impact that God has uh, planned for our life, well, but for in the resurrection, but God knows. Right. So be confident. He, we can trust him. So tell me about God's family. Well, absolutely. You know, I will start with the caveat by saying I am not an expert on the family. I'm a student. Uh, you know, we, we talked jokingly at first about um, the difficulties that families face. And I know my family is no different. Uh, you know, there was alcoholism in our family. There was dysfunction. My folks were divorced when mm-hmm. I was in high school. So th- there were some difficulties that I experienced growing up. And that's not unlike many families. Right. But I, I think uh, it has helped me to realize the importance of family. You know, when, when we struggle, we, we look uh, and we try and understand and make sense of what God is about and what God is doing. Uh, and, you know, Sister Lucia, the, one of the visionaries of Fatima, said, the decisive battle between the Lord and the kingdom of Satan will be over marriage and the family. Sure. It, it's a critical time in our history. Families are under attack. You know, and people are, are asking questions that we never thought to ask. What is marriage? You know, what, what does that mean? What, what is a man and a woman? I mean, there, there are some ridiculous things being posed now, and, and we see that very clearly. But, um, you know, th- there's, there's more subtle things going on as well in, in attacks on the family. And when we look at our history, the attack on the family has been something that's been going on since Adam and Eve. Well, without a doubt. And, and I think we can say without, without – it's not, no hyperbolic statements here – the foundation of a society, of a church, of, of a people – is not necessarily the government, but it really is the family. Absolutely. The family is the foundation, and marriage is the basis of that fundamental unit of, of, of society, the family unit. Well, the, the family is relevant to everyone. Wh- whether or not people have their own children or not, we all are born into a family. Absolutely. We all have parents. Yeah. We all have extended family. Right. Uh, so it, it's something, it's a topic that we understand. And, you know, I, I always joke with my kids, you, know, you can't you can't choose who you're related from. My, my kids are stuck with me. I'm stuck with my parents. I can't choose different parents. Uh, but I, I firmly believe that God chooses the family for us specifically. Uh, that may be up for debate whether that's to you know, cause great suffering and great holiness as a result due to the patience. Or maybe he has a good sense of humor. Maybe. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, you know, families... Uh, they're, they're the greatest, for most of us, either the greatest source of joy or, or even sometimes sorrow. Uh, you know, we journey together. We're, we're not in this thing alone. We journey together. And so there, there's a collectiveness to our experience as human beings. And thank God for that. You know, it, it's not just me and Jesus. It's us. And, you know, to, to look at the big picture— Glory to God for that, because when we follow God, we don't just get him. We get the Blessed Mother. We get the company of angels and saints. We, we have so many helpers along the way to get us there. Uh, we just need to, to connect with them. Yeah. yeah. And, and part of God giving us an imagery of him as Father helps us to get closer uh, to the understanding of who God is, right? And we... Take a look at that from different perspectives. Uh, you know, we need to be children in order to appreciate who God is. Well, when you look at a child, look at the absolute pure love that they have for their parents and confidence, right? You can have great confidence in your parents. Why? Because the, the eyes of the child see them as their absolute benefactor and the person who loves them unconditionally. That's who God is. That's what God is trying to tell us, that he does love us unconditionally. Right. Well, and we're at a time in history, Peter, that the world needs good families. Yep. 
it desperately needs good families. You know, we're, we're called to be a light in the darkness. And I think uh, how many of us can, can think back to a family that we knew when we were kids that spoke to us? They may never have been religious, or we may never have seen those things, but they were solid. They loved one another. They tried. They, you know, there was always screw-ups, and, you know, no, no, no family is perfect. But you know what? They, they were doing something significant, and you could tell just by spending five minutes in their house that, that something was different about them. Right. Yeah, there you are. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I go back to, you know, why, why is it that we're even in a family? Um, in preparation for this time, one of the passages that came up was from the book of Ephesians, St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Uh, the whole book of Ephesians is a great Bible study uh, on the family. So if you, uh, if you feel inspired at some point this month, uh, definitely take a look at that. It's six chapters long. It takes probably about 20 minutes to read it. Uh, but it kind of gives you a, a real broad look at, at family and what, what St. Paul was thinking. Uh, in Ephesians 3.14, he says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Now, wow. I mean, if you unpack that a little bit, our families really take their lead from God and God's family. Um, when, when we think of God, um, God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. God is all-present. You know, the, the fancy words, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. I can't relate a darn thing to that, yeah. you know, because I am not any of those things. Not quite. Not even, a, you know, uh, the, there's that uh, passage that we, we say on, at Lent, you know, we are but dust. And, right. of course, the youth minister friends of mine will say we're, we're God's butt dust, <laughs> um, you know, because we're just a speck tiny, compared. Tiny. We're teeny. I mean, not yeah. even an atom on, you know, God's elbow, you know. But, but yet, even with that— we have a God that wants to be known. And how does this unbelievably just superlative person make himself known to us lowly little peons? Well, when we think of God, who God is, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a trinity. It's a mystery. We think about that every year on Trinity Sunday, yet a trinity is a family. And so he's provided us a way to understand him. It's downloaded into the very human nature that we have so that we can understand. You know, you look in the book of Genesis. We were created in God's image, male and female. Uh, Genesis 2.18, it's not good for man to be alone. Uh, Genesis 2.24, therefore a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife and they become one flesh. God's addition is a little different than ours. One plus one equals three, three. for God. Yeah. And that one, you know, that one flesh that the couple become is so real nine months later, I get to be there at the birthday party. And how amazing is that? Uh, I, I don't know about you, Peter, but I I know that when my wife and I had kids, we've been very blessed. We have eight living children and five in heaven that, oh that were goodness, miscarriages. Yeah. Uh, but when we started having kids, it gave me huge insights into who God was. Oh, no doubt. It called me to be better, better yeah. as a person, better as a dad. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll just say, I only have two children. I'm, I'm grateful to have them. But I always refer, and my daughter's just picked it up recently, I always refer to my oldest daughter and my youngest daughter. Yeah. Why would I do that if I only have two? It's because we had miscarriages as, as sure. well. And... and you know, the child in the womb is is not only real, but loved and missed as well. Right. Yeah. God makes himself understood in the family. So it, there's no doubt why the, the evil one wants to attack the family, because it keeps us from understanding our Heavenly Father. Right. That, that makes perfect sense. It, it even begs the question, Peter, why, why were we created? You know, it, God, this omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient being doesn't need us. God is eternally happy in the Trinity, just being that eternal family. He doesn't need us. In fact, we hurt him. We make life worse for God. You know, but why, why does he even create in the first place? Well, I think it goes back to who God is. And, and in 1 John, we, we hear that God is love. Love is not always rational. 
You know, love doesn't always make sense from our human standpoint, okay? Um, love is there and gives itself freely away without reservation. It, it makes no sense in some ways because you think of the mother that would push her child out of the way of a moving car and, sure. and die herself. She yeah. would, or, or how many times have I heard, you know, we're going into surgery and a concerned mother would say, if something happens to me, I want you to pay attention to the baby and take, take care right. of the baby. If yeah. something happens to me, that's okay. What um, we're the only creatures that do that in addition to God. Animal, the animal kingdom will not do that for their young. They may, you know, try and protect, but if it comes to sacrificing your life for another in that way, animals don't do that. So it's something unique, and and it's because of love and us being created in in love and us imaging God as as the creator. Yeah, and it, it gives us some insight into who God is because I, you know, when when our children are young, they keep us up at night, and when they're teenagers, they keep us up at night. Uh, but uh, and and we know they have difficulties that need to be dealt with, and sometimes discipline that needs to be, I don't know, affected. What's a good word? You know, yeah. imposed. But we're loving them all the time, and that's where God is. God is loving us. Wherever we are, whatever we are, whoever we are, whatever we are, because we're his beloved children, right? And and love is freely given, right? You know, it's it's a free gift. You know, which begs the question: if you can get it and receive it freely, you can also reject it freely, and and that's kind of the next part. Where did where did things go wrong for the human family? Yeah, we, we know Genesis three well. You know, free will means we can choose not to love, and Adam and Eve were faced with that test, and they they failed miserably. Human nature is weak, you know, and, and they were not fallen at that time. So human nature in and of itself is weak. It's not God. It's created. But fallen human nature is even weaker. And, and, and let me tell you about another thing I forgot was this is St. Joseph Radio presents coming to you live from St. Louis, Missouri, the Rome of the West. I'm your host, Peter Karutz, and uh, this is Dr. Gazard with us yeah. today. And we're talking about human nature and Adam and Eve and how they kind of stumbled Badly. They did. Well, you know, we're so captivated with this discussion. It's, it's hard to remember. We have to take a pause every once, once in a while. Once in a while, yeah. <laughs> and bow to our, you know, our uh, sponsors here. Yes. Um, you know, when, when we think of the fall, you know, the, the family of God was ruptured. You mm-hmm. know, there, there was this innocence that Adam and Eve had. And, and once that was forfeited. Damaged, yeah. Damaged. Uh, life was never the same. It, it couldn't be. Uh, you know, if you look in Genesis 3, you know, the serpent, first of all, is cursed. Eve has pains in childbirth. I've witnessed that. Uh, there's some element of spousal domination, you know, where, you know, she, she's serving her husband now, and, and he's, not, he's not perfect either. Adam has to work much harder and toil and do his labor for God. But ultimately, as you mentioned, death enters the family. Yeah. Prior to that, there wasn't. Um, and it, it's not fair. You know, I, I think about that. For, for those of us that are not Adam and Eve, it's not fair. It's not our fault. Yeah. I mean, why is it that I'm taking a hit for what they did? Interesting. You know, in our 21st century uh, modern thinking, we're very individualistic. Why should I suffer because of somebody else's screw up? You know, it, it's kind of like, though, the, if my grandfather lost his house in a poker game, I still don't get his house. That's right. He blew it, you know, but I, I don't get that inheritance that he was going to give me. So there, there's a generational and a communal aspect to sin, and it's a loss of grace that affects all of us. And, and that's and, just, and that's the way just it is. being real, right? I mean, right. it's just being real. If parents do bad things, it's going to affect their children. Right. It, and it isn't fair. But uh, there's no rule that says life is fair. Yeah, but it, it, it may not be f- fair, but maybe it's for our good, too. Ultimately, I think it's a testimony to the mercy of God that sure. he can take something awful yeah. and turn it into something good. And he always does. And he always does. Yeah. Yeah, when we, when we think about God's family in the Old Testament, in, in the first three chapters, I, I quoted that one verse from Ephesians 3, chapter 14, or uh, verse 14. But in the first three chapters of Ephesians, Paul really discusses how God was mysteriously at work through history. You know, and, and when you think about it, if, if you uh, 
if you want some reference, um, there's a, a talk by Scott Hahn on salvation history that's fantastic. Uh, there's the, the Great Adventure Bible Timeline by Jeff Cavins. Fantastic resources. And it gives, you know, we, we're trying to cover 6,000 years of history in an hour, uh, and they can do it much more eloquently and they have more time. But when you look at, at the structure of what God is doing, you know, he starts with Adam and Eve in a marriage, and the family starts to grow. When you get to Noah, you got Noah and all of his kids and their family, so it's a household. By the time you get to Abraham, it's kind of a tribe, a tribal right. chieftain. Yep. He, he's that chieftain. Then by the time you get to Moses, he's kind of nation. dealing with a nation, yep. right? And yep. then when you think about David and Solomon, you're talking about a kingdom. That's where you, where a nation subjugates other nations, you know, as, uh, you know, helpers to help them along. So when you look at the the entirety of the Old Testament, 6,000 years in an hour, you see God's family expanding rapidly. Uh, it's growing in size and complexity. And I don't know if any of you have tried to coordinate a big group at Disneyland or something like that, but it is, <laughs> the bigger the group, it's it's a nightmare to yeah. try and keep everybody moving in one direction. And and what's a poor God to do? I mean, he's he's got this huge family. Um, the, so the free choice of Adam, it takes the human family out of God's direct presence. Uh, and, you know, the life that was once in the garden is now gone. It's long gone. Uh, the family, Adam and Eve had this purity and this clarity of thought. Uh, and when they left, their intellects were darkened. They, they couldn't see things as clearly as they once did because of the nature between their relationship with God and one another. Uh, and and then we can't see the path home. And even if we could, here, here's the kicker. Our prideful will is weak. We wouldn't choose to go back in and of ourselves apart from grace. Yeah, and you said that it, it, you said it quickly, but you said th- when they left the garden, and I, I think that sometimes we were talking about this this morning. I think that we we need to realize that th- they weren't necessarily thrown out, but they left. What, what hit, hits me hard is when uh, uh, when they realized that they had sinned. Uh, and they hid themselves, and and I I think the word hid or is very uh, telling of the word run or hide or uh, go away. You know they couldn't be in God's presence anymore because they didn't want to. Absolutely, yeah. They they didn't want to. When we when we see them. Um, yeah, they, they don't necessarily want to, to be there at that point. Why? It had Adam, let, let's say just for instance, with everything that we know about our Heavenly Father, they blew it. Yep. If, they, if Adam and Eve were to have fallen on their knees right then and there and said, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I've never gone to confession before, but I think this is what I need to do. Will you please forgive me? Absolutely, it would have happened. Yeah, and there were so many chances. You know, yes. Eve could have done it. Eve, Eve could have said, oh, I did it. I'm bad. I'm, I did wrong. I'm sorry. Forgive me. She she went to Adam. Adam could have said, Eve, you did wrong. Let's go and forgive. Right. A- after they both did wrong, they could have said, I'm not going to run away. You know, there's that parable of the young rich man. Uh, and he goes to Jesus and says, what, what, what do I need to do to gain eternal life? And he says, well, you know, follow the Ten Commandments, love your father, love your mother, love God. Et cetera, yeah. et cetera. I've done that through all my life. And then he says, well, give up everything you have and follow me. And then as the story goes, he, he went away sad. And I've always been intrigued by that. What did he do wrong? And everybody points to the fact that he had, you know, he, was a, he had many possessions and he didn't give it up. But I... I, I, I'm going to suggest something different. What he, what he did wrong was that he went away. That's what Adam and Eve did. They went away. Right. God is always here and there and everywhere and waiting for us to, to, to just for, want forgiveness because he'll do it. Right. Don't go away. That's right. the problem. Don't go away. I, I'm not sure if it's a famous painting, but I have this image burned into my mind of of God pointing 
at Adam and Eve and them walking and sulking out of the garden. It, it's almost as if a parent is telling a child, go to your room, you've been disobedient. <laughs> right. And when we really stop and think about it, I, I don't think that's necessarily the father that we know. But I, lo- I look at the story and the narrative I think they were runaways more yeah, than yeah. castaways. You, you know, they they wanted to leave because you know here the, the when you look at the the in between the lines, the devil tells them, "Hey, if you eat of this fruit, you won't die." Mm, yeah, they eat of the fruit. Right now, Peter, did they die? Yes or no? Uh, well, yes, yes and no. Yes, yeah, yes. I mean, it's no. both and, yeah, right? And we is. we know that because. Physically, they did not die. They, not at that not moment. Not at that moment. Right. But spiritually, they did. Their, sure. their relationship with God was never the same. They had given up their their dignity, their sonship and daughtership, if you will, uh, for something else. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so it, it's a scenario where I, I could easily see Adam saying, God lied to us. Yeah. He said we were going to die. Here we are. The devil told us the truth. And and so as a result, what else is the devil right about? And there they go on their merry way out of the garden, and now they don't have an opportunity to come back immediately. The, the devil has his own mo, doesn't he? I mean, he through all eternity, he do, he is the father of lies because he mixes a, a, a little salting of the truth, right, for no other reason than to misdirect. So. He told them, "You will surely not die," and 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 the truth was they wouldn't die at that particular moment. God's word was still true, but that's what he wants to do. He doesn't want to. He, he wants to just push us off, you know, a half a degree, move us away. And how does he do it? He puts a little bit of the truth in there, which makes his lie so much more effective. Right. Well, and. Spiritually, they did die. Spiritually, they did die. Which was a fate worse than physical death. Of course, yeah. Because they they gave up something so precious right. that they didn't appreciate. Right. right. Getting back to, to the 6,000 years of history, which we need to get through, uh, I, I realize we're woefully ignorant of our, our history, and maybe we'll get to that when we get back. And we will. <laughs> so this is uh, our opportunity to regroup and get to that 6,000 years. Now we have a uh, half an hour to to get to the rest of the 6,000 years. But this is talking about God's family, starting way back at the beginning of this family tree. Uh, We're not perfect, uh, never will be, never have been, but uh, you know what? We're loved. (laughs) We're loved just the way we are. So this is your opportunity to go out and tell somebody about what you're listening to and encourage them to turn it on, ask them to join you. And we'll be back in just about two minutes. Hi, this is Matt Logeman with St. Joseph Radio with a great gift idea, a St. Benedict bracelet, a trendy accessory for men, women, and children that not only looks good on everyone's wrist, but is actually armor for the spiritual battlefield. This unique bracelet is handmade in Europe and contains 10 medals within the braided cord in the adult size and 7 medals in the children's size. On the front of each beautiful medal is St. Benedict holding a cross in his right hand, the object of his devotion. On the back of each medal is a cross. Surrounding the back of the medal and cross are the letters V. E-R-S-N-M-V-S-M-Q-L-I-V-B, in Latin reference which translates, Be gone, Satan. Never tempt me with your vanities. What you offer me is evil. Drink the poison yourself. And finally located at the top is the word Pax, which means peace. All bracelets come packaged with an informational card and the St. Benedict blessing which your local priest can administer. This gift is for everyone you love and care about, including yourself. Available from St. Joseph Radio, check the website at www.saintjosephradio.net. St. Joseph Catholic Radio is proud to announce the launch of SJEN TV, the St. Joseph Evangelization Network. SJEN TV is a premier online Catholic broadcasting network providing quality Catholic programming 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. We have programming such as live studio interviews, St. Joe's Java speaker presentations, current Catholic issues, and the Pro Life series. We're featuring the many talented speakers out of Orange County, California, and this Archdiocese of St. Louis, Missouri. 
Society, including Professor John Gresham, Father James Mason, Karen Nokemper, Rick Hollerick, Bill Federer, and many more. To review the program list, go to sjen.tv or on Roku, sjen.tv. All this programming is free, and we are welcoming sponsorship of new programs. Find out more at sjen.tv. <laughs> And we're back. Uh, this is St. Joseph Radio Presents. I'm your host, Peter Karutz. We are here live in St. Louis with Dr. Gossard, and we were just looking at the phone, making sure that all the moms are doing well, and so far, so good. Yep, babies are staying put, and that's the deal I had with God anyway, so we could do this talk. That's right, yeah. So uh, 3 o'clock this morning, don't worry about sleeping. You'll have other things to do. I, I was awake this morning preparing for this talk, and fortunately no babies interrupted that preparation. There you go. Yeah. There you go. So as I was saying, I, I think as um, a 20, 21st century uh, Christian audience, we're woefully ignorant of our family history yeah. and genealogy. Um, I, I made reference to the Great Adventure Bible Timeline by Jeff Cavins. Uh, for those of you that are on, that are seeing this on video, I've, I've got this here. It's a four piece of paper timeline of of basically the entire Old Testament. Um, I'm sure you can see it on the radio as well. But yes, of course. Yeah, absolutely. I think the question to ask ourselves is, we read these narratives in the Old Testament, where did all these other nations come from? Yeah. You know, I oh, think yeah. it's the, oh, these question. mysterious, you know, it, it's like the Native American population in, in America, or, mm. you know, the, these people just ma- magically show up. Uh, and I, I think that something like the Bible timeline, uh, the Great Adventure uh series really gives us an idea and an understanding much better of where these other nations came from. Uh, when we think of God's people, where where did God's people come from? It was Noah's family. You know, after the flood, everybody was wiped out, but Noah's family. Uh, and we tend to use certain words inter- interchangeably, like Semitic peoples mm-hmm. or Hebrews yeah. or Israelites or Jews. Sure. You know, but... For someone like St. Paul, who knew the Old Testament like the back of his hand, because basically he didn't have the New Testament under his arm. It wasn't he had it formulated. It was in his head. It was in right. his heart. Uh, but he had the Torah, and he you know, had probably a lot of these writings of the prophets and whatnot. Um, when we look at the timeline, for example, um, one of Noah's sons, Shem, became the father of the Semites, the Shemites, okay? Um there was a the great grandson of Shem was named Eber, and he was the father of the Eberus, the Hebrews, uh, and Jacob Israel. You know, the father of the twelve tribes. Joseph was one of the kids from the amazing. Yeah, time. Right. He had the coat of many colors. That's right. You know, he was renamed Israel, and so the Israelites were basically descendants of of him, and and the Jews were descendants of Judah, which was one of those tribes. So right. it's kind of, you know, as we think of our family genealogy, I don't know if any of you have done that for your own family, uh, the early uh, Christians like St. Paul and and those folks knew their family history much better than we did. So they, they this wasn't lost on them. The other branches, we talk about these other tribes, uh, Ham, for example, which was one of the, the sons of Noah, he had couple of sons, Egypt, mm-hmm. Canaan, Lot, which was Abraham's nephew, had a couple of sons, Ammon, Moab. You know, so when when the Israelites or, or when the early Christian church would hear these names, these countries, right. they knew exactly where they came from. It was basically my uncle's cousin's family. That's right. And, and sometimes those branches of the family were not all that godly. Mm-hmm. They had gone off and fallen off the family tree a little bit and gotten off course. When, when we think about uh, the, the garden, you know, there, there was the devil, and there was a third of the angels, mm-hmm. the devils. They were very much present outside of the garden as well. And many of these other branches of the, of the family tree fell into idol worship. They fell into worshiping false gods, and really it was these demonic influences that led them to do very perverse things. You know, so when, when we think about all of this, it's, it's kind of a big family feud. There's no uh, Richard Dawson or uh, Steve Harvey or anything like that, but it's, right. it's a big family feud where God's family is growing, and 
there's persecution, you know, from from these other families. And continuous falling aways, right? right? You know, I mean, we talked about all of those lines of, 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 of families, if you will, or nations or kingdoms. But many of them, all of them almost, all fell away. Some never came back. Absolutely. You know, so as I mentioned, you know, Noah was the start, the fresh start. Cain... Uh, you know, one of the first kids of, of Adam and Eve um, ends up killing his brother Abel. Immediately leaving the garden, I, I think the children are more rebellious when they first leave mm-hmm. yeah. God's presence. Yeah. Uh, and Cain and, and his generation were very evil. Uh, we, we jokingly say because Cain was a farmer and, and Abel was a, a, a shepherd. Yeah, kind of a rancher. Yeah. And, and there's I saw something on Babylon B that said uh, the reason Cain's uh, offering was rejected was it was actually kale in the very early, you know, and, <laughs> and God did kale. not accept that as an offering. So <laughs> not a plug for the Babylon B, but I thought that was, yeah, that you was know, good. Well, yeah. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, when we, we see what's going on, you know, God – had so much concern for Seth. You know, after Cain and Abel were gone, Seth came along, and, and Seth was the line that God's promise. And, and, and by promise, I mean, th- this was the line that was faithful. They, they continued to worship. They continued to pray and try and follow, not perfectly, of course, but they tried to follow what God had commanded them to do and be faithful to that. So... You know, the the human family was preserved through Noah after this flood because it, it got so crazy and so evil. It, it's as if God said, I need to take my child out of this situation. You know, when God fathers his family, sometimes for their own good, he has to remove his children from a very evil situation. And that's what we would do as parents, too. Absolutely. You know, whether the child likes it, doesn't like it, understands, doesn't understand Right. It's what's good for them, so that's what God would do. That's right. what we would do. Right. Go boating. Yeah. You know, build a boat right. and, and put your kids in there. Yeah. It's going to get wet. It's going to get wet. Yeah. The problem, though, is original sin got on the boat with them. You know, you you can take the, the people out of a sinful situation, but you can't take the sin out of the people. Right. And I, I think that's clearly what happened with Noah's family. Uh, and you can read the the narrative uh, and, and know about it as, as well as, as I do. Um so, you know, it, it entered the ark, uh, and God promised he'd never wipe away humanity again. He sent the rainbow. So, okay, God's kind of stuck now. He's got right. to figure out a different way because he can't just wipe, wipe us out again right. to protect his, his truth. Yeah. Um, but I, I think the really important take-home point is, is that God doesn't want to do that. This is a father that loves all his children, even the ones that have fallen away, especially the ones that have fallen away. Uh, this is the father that will leave the 99 that are doing what they're supposed to be doing and go out after the one that's lost. You know, he, he hasn't forgotten about these wayward children, even though they're worshiping idols, even though they've completely rejected him freely and walked away. He still loves them and wants to somehow provide a scenario that, that can bring them back home. And will and does. And will and does. Yeah. Absolutely. Is God a vengeful God? Well, I, I think the way I would answer that is God sometimes lets us accept the consequences of our actions. Say that again, because that was good. Because God will let us accept the consequences of our actions. Right. He steps back and says, okay, this is what you want. I think that's completely wrong, and it's not in accordance with what I know is best for you. But because you want that more than me, I will let you have it. Free will. He respects our free will. And it's almost a condition of love. How do I love somebody if I can't freely choose not to? God wants us to love him, so he'll even risk ha- uh, having us uh, reject him. Absolutely. There, there's the old adage, everything happens for a reason. Sometimes that reason is you're stupid and make bad decisions. <laughs> yeah, and, right. and this is played that's out right. in almost every generation of the Old Testament. <laughs> yeah. You know, they... 
we're reading this and we're shouting at the Bible, you idiots, why right. are you doing this? God has given you so much, why don't you see it? Yeah, stop and doing yet, that. yet the plank is sticking out of our own eye. We, we don't see that. We're looking at the speck in the, in the Old Testament. We, we see how God is, is fathering his family, and there's a pattern that develops. You know, the, the kids are desiring something other than God, so they, they're sinning. They eventually get thrown into slavery or servitude because of these bad decisions. They realize what an idiot I am, and they cry out to God in supplication. Uh, and in God's mercy, he reaches down. When they finally kind of learned their lesson, he reaches down and saves them. Uh, and then then there's peace. You know, there's peace. What, what did God have in mind? This is a, a great question from the Old Testament because... I think it gets clouded by all the sin and all the idolatry and all the stuff going on. What did God really have in mind for his family? Uh, Because he, as any good parent experiences, we can't just clobber our kids over the head with the truth because they won't receive it. So what do we do? We sometimes just have to be silent and wait for those proper moments when we when they're receptive to it. And I think that's exactly what God does in the Old Testament. We He kept his mouth shut because they weren't going to listen and they weren't going to do anything about it. So the first thing that comes up is in Exodus 4, uh, verse 22, uh, with Moses. You know, Moses, God says to Moses, Say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. The way that God saw this whole picture was that, that the people of the promise, those that were following him, were supposed to be the older brother. It wasn't that you're better than all these other kids. You know, I'm mom's favorite. I'm dad's favorite. That's not it at all. It's you're the older brother, but you're supposed to serve these younger ones, teach them right from wrong, be a good example. But in those days, the sin of those other tribes, those other families was so great. And spiritually, the Israelites, the the family of God was so weak that the sin would overcome the goodness in those people. So... It evolved into you got to kind of stay stay away from these people because you're not strong enough. Right. And they weren't. You're not ready. They weren't. They weren't ready. You know, yeah. God had a lot of growing up for them to do that's right. before they were going to be ready to do this. So, you know, that's that's one thing that, that uh, Israel was called to be the firstborn son, the older brother. And in that time, that older brother was meant to be the priests, or, you know, the, the father, the priesthood at that point was the, the head father, of the family. The head of the family, right? You know, there was not a separate priesthood. Right. The father was the priest and the provider, and the oldest son would get a double portion of the inheritance because he was supposed to take care of the younger members of the family and would inherit that that spiritual priesthood in a sense, the natural priesthood. Greater responsibility, and exactly you know, there were resources for him to fulfill that. Greater exactly. So there was a special role. Yeah. Um, the the other thing in uh, Exodus nineteen verse six. God says, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my own possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You know, so he, he wants to make us those, those priests. You know, we're, we're all called, it, by virtue of our baptism, priest, That's prophet, right. king, right? That's right. Uh, and that, that was the original plan. So he's saying this to Moses up on Mount Sinai. And then a few minutes later, he says, um, you need to go down and talk to your people. He goes down, and there's this golden calf. Immediately and, doing the worship of idols. Uh, Come on. Uh, which was one of the idols of Egypt. They, right. You know, they had gotten out of Egypt, but Egypt was still very much a part of them, Yep. even though they had gone. So here they are worshiping the golden calf. The Levites step up, and they're the only righteous ones that are willing to obey what God is saying, so they're anointed the priests. So the firstborn son doesn't get it. It's now the Levites. So it's kind of plan B for God. So we, we talk about Israel being the firstborn son that God wants a kingdom of priests. Then in Numbers eleven twenty nine, 29, these are these little tidbits that God is saying. Um, Moses is showing the people the promised land. They're overlooking on this you know, mountain, overlooking Canaan. And he's showing them where God is calling them to go. And there are these two guys that didn't get the message they were supposed to go see this 
place, and they're prophesying in the camp, Eldad and Medad, uh, and they're saying, tell them to stop. And Moses says, oh, that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. You know, so these, these little rumble strips, you know, firstborn son, kingdom of priests, prophets. Uh, and then in 1 Samuel, we see that God's people want a king. Yeah. And we'll get to that. We'll get to that. God <laughs> didn't want to give them a king. They wanted a king. Yeah. And God sometimes will give us what we demand, even if it isn't uh, good for us, right? right. Got to be that free will. This is St. Joseph Radio, coming to you live from St. Louis, Missouri. I'm your host today, Peter Karutz, and we're here with Dr. Gossard. And we are talking about God's family. Uh, we're reaching way back. Where would where, we end up right now in, our, in God's family? We are at the time where the Israelites are asking for a king, they're God asking. wants to be their king. He says, right. I'm your king. He's the king of kings. I am the king of kings. But you want one? You want to be like everybody else? Well, right. I'll give you what you want. He does. He acquiesces to what they're wanting because he doesn't want to push his kids away. Mm -hmm. If he says no, they're going to leave him. Yeah. So he says, all right, you want a king? I'll give you Saul. And then Saul anoints. Well, Saul ends up getting uh, taken over by David and then Solomon. You know, so the children don't realize that they're already royalty. They've forgotten that, that they're royalty, and they, they want somebody else to be royalty in their lives. You know, so firstborn son, priest, prophet, and king. We see that clearly. This is what God wants in the Old Testament for his family. These are the most important things. So did Paul know his Old Testament? Did he know all this? Did he see this? You know, in the beginning of Ephesians, he talks about the mystery, for he has made known, this is uh, verse, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, for he's made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which is set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things to him, things in heaven and things on earth. Now, that word mystery is kind of, um, it's an unusual thing. Uh, there, there's only one place in the Old Testament where that word mysterion is used, and it's the oh. book of Daniel. Is that right? The Book little... of Daniel. And it's used eight times in one chapter, Daniel chapter two. Oh. Do you think that's a coincidence that he mentions the same word that's, you know, he, he's pointing his readers to the book of Daniel. Right. And, and in, this, in this story, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, Bad guy. He's, he's had a dream and he says, I want somebody to tell me what this dream means. And all his sorcerers say, sure, we'll, we'll tell you. And he says, okay, first of all, I want you to tell me what the dream was and then tell me what it means. And they said, how can we do that? You tell us and then we'll interpret it. And he wouldn't do that. Well, of course, and he's smart because then they would just say something right. to please him. Yes. Right. Uh, you know, I, I've thought about calling up the psychic hotline and saying, yeah. I'm not going to give you my name. You already know that. Right. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar is doing here. Uh, and D Daniel, the prophet Daniel, responds to his challenge and proceeds to give him the story of the, the beast that has four metals. Okay. There's gold, silver, bronze, and iron as parts of this beast body. Uh, and then he interprets it. There's four kingdoms. There's Babylon, then the, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. There's four kingdoms that are coming. And his is, hey, king, guess what? You're not going to be the top of the heap for too much longer because this is going to not go your way. But what Paul sees in this story is that God is going to use these nations to purify his people. Okay, the Babylon or the Babylonians took the Israelites into captivity. Mm -hmm. They took the northern tribes uh, into captivity earlier, and then the southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, much later. You know, a couple hundred years later, they were able to hold out, and they lost everything. Babylon destroyed the temple that Solomon had built. It was the, the most glorious thing that they had. It was their center of worship. And now, not only do they not have the temple, they're in exile, they're slaves, they're gone. They have nothing that they can identify with. Uh, their land, their possessions, their dignity as God's chosen, which they were holding on to, had been, been crushed. They couldn't fulfill their lawful duties, the law. 
They had taken for granted all that they had received, and it wasn't until it's gone. <laughs> That's a parody for our lives. You don't appreciate what you had until it's gone. And the same thing. They, they had chosen to forsake God like their family before them. They had nobody to blame but themselves, and God used these nations, these foreigners, which were really part of his family, just distant cousins, that God used these foreigners to purify his people. And Paul saw that very clearly with this mystery, how God can take something awful like slavery, captivity, exile, which was really the worst thing that could happen to those Jewish people, the worst. And somehow he hadn't forgotten his people. And in fact, he had a bigger plan. Not only was he going to bring his people back, but his ultimate plan was to bring all those nations back with him and with them. Uh, And how how do you reach out? What's a poor God to do? How does he reach out to these other nations that are pagan worshipers? Uh, You know, the Romans, the Greeks. I mean, they they had no knowledge, the unknown God in Greek Mm -hmm. at the Acropolis. By that point, they didn't know who the heck God was. That's right. And Paul, Paul identified it. So does God feel sorry for the exiles and bail them out? Uh Uh-uh. He doesn't. Because... A bailout would have been wrathful. It would have been, it, sometimes it's more merciful to let your child fall because they need to learn. They need to grow up. He, I, it, we do our kids a big disservice if they're still at home when they're 30 years old. Well, we of course. Tr- yeah. teach them to grow up. Yeah, and there was some contradiction, at least in, in my mind, when, when Nebuchadnezzar, a bad guy, right, an idol mm-hmm. worshiper, but God commanded his faithful people to respect his authority and to work with him, if you will. Why? I think it's part of that pruning that needed to be done by these, by the, uh, the faithful folks. And in the end, I think they touched his heart. Didn't make him a good guy. But looking at the faithfulness of these Jews and being you know, faced with even death and punishment and worse, God used him to purify his own people. Absolutely. And change at least change the heart of Nebuchadnezzar a little bit. Daniel gives him the interpret. He tells him the dream and he gives him the interpretation. Nebuchadnezzar says, there is no God on earth but your God, the God of the Israelites. Here he's prophesying this pagan king is saying the most true. He's got more faith than than half the people in Israel. God uses everybody. God uses it. You know, so what's God really getting getting at here? He didn't give them a bailout. They went into exile, but... they needed that time. They needed suffering because suffering purifies our heart. It makes us realize our great need for God. They, they didn't appreciate what they had lost. Like Adam and Eve, they, they were so focused on these other more peripheral things that they, the real loss was their dignity as children of God, who they were created in, in his image and likeness. Uh, and that's, God wanted to bring the whole family back. You know, what, what's God getting at? In Hosea chapter 6, and it's also uh, uh, Jesus quotes it in Matthew uh, chapter 9, verse 13. I desire mercy. You you need to know what what the meaning of I desire mercy, not sacrifice is. Mm -hmm. Up to that point, the Jewish religion had been very sacrificial. Their temple was was filled with temple sacrifices, cattle, sheep, and goats. There was a huge economy because... They felt that if they could make these sacrifices, that it helped them to get right with God, that God was somehow pleased by those sacrifices. And God's saying, I don't want that. God's saying, I didn't even want a temple. This big, huge building that Solomon built, one of the glories of the ancient world that took how many hundreds, 400 years to build, I didn't want that temple. I want the temple of your soul, your heart. That's the temple I dream about being in. And, and you, you don't know how much you need me until you suffer like this. So the, their problem, the problem of the exiles, and it's our problem too, is we think like human beings and we don't think like God. Right. I guess you can't fault us for that because yeah. we are not God. That's right. Uh, we are human beings. You know, they... For them, they, they thought the end-all, be-all was being a member of the chosen people. It was a privilege. You're, you're in a club. 
you were born into that club. It was very, they were very proud of that. And God says, you know, with great privilege comes great responsibility. You're supposed to be a servant. You're supposed to be a servant of all as an older brother to younger siblings, that we're all children of God. Um, And, you know, there, there were definitely some differences. You know, do we really realize the depravity that we have apart from God? Only when we realize this, that we're poor, homeless, starving children, orphans, Orphans. Yeah. Do we realize that we're we're the lost sheep that he's been looking for? Yeah. He comes not to call the righteous but sinners. And all we can say is, my Lord and my God, I believe, help my unbelief. There we are. So come back and see us next time. In about four weeks or so, uh, we're going to be talking about more of God as Father and the, maybe the prodigal son, maybe more. Come back again, visit us, and tell a friend. You've been listening to St. Joseph Radio Presents from the Rome of the West, St. Louis, Missouri. If you would like to join us in our evangelization efforts, you can order a copy of today's broadcast or any of our past programs by visiting us on our website, stjosephradio.net. That's S-A-I-N-T, josephradio.net. Or call us, 636-447-6000. It's all at your fingertips to help us evangelize the world, bringing the good news of Christ to everyone you meet and change one soul at a time. Thank you for your prayers and support. Until next time, may God bless you and your family. This has been a presentation of St. Joseph Radio Presents.